Amen. Hebrews 11, verse 30, and if you do not have a Bible with you, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. You can take one of those out, and if you, did not, if you do not own a Bible that's a little easier to read, or if you just don't own one in general, we would love for you to take that as a gift from us. Hebrews 11, verse 30. Let's set the stage that our writer in Hebrews is presenting. The Jewish believers of this church were in the midst of either the beginning or soon to be the beginning of persecution in their lives for being believers in Jesus Christ, for following Christ. And as we've journeyed through this book together, we have said over and over and over again that this is about the writer of Hebrews telling them to remain anchored in Christ, that they have a far better person that they are following, high priest, king. And in this, he then goes back and gives them some examples over the last few weeks. We've been looking at these examples in Hebrews 11 of those that live by faith and what living by faith looks like and what they anticipated with that and how they looked forward even some thousand years to Christ being king. And then we hit this today. Israel had crossed the Jordan River. Virtually nothing really remained between them and the campaign that was going to happen in the land of Canaan. War, they knew, was coming soon. And behind this mass of God's people, the Jordan River was flowing again. There was no way back. They are now in this new place, in this new land. And before them, there we see the towers and the walls of Jericho. Gates sealed tight. Men of war on the walls. Really, most of the Israelites had never seen any sort of fortified city And you could just imagine some of the pessimism that probably was there at that moment, despite the miracle that had just happened in crossing the Jordan. Humanly speaking, there was a gentleman by the name of Joshua that was now bearing the lone responsibility of leadership. The lone responsibility of leadership of an unpredictable Frightened people. You could just imagine that Joshua every once in a while would go, Hey, Moses, oh, he's not here. Hey, hey, Moses, oh, I, I got to do this thing. I got to lead. Joshua had sole authority. He needed to get away and to pray and to meditate and to plan this conquest that God had put before him. And then a heavenly encounter happens. Joshua goes out of the camp into the darkness. Really, you could kind of picture him going up out and viewing the walls of Jericho for himself to seek God's guidance. God's word tells us that Joshua was near Jericho in Joshua 5. And by the way, probably be wise for you to go back to Joshua 5 and 6 this morning because we're going to spend actually our time there. Joshua 5.13 says he was near Jericho and expresses this idea of of immediate proximity, and he was close, perhaps close enough really to feel the oppression of the city described earlier as walled up to heaven, Deuteronomy 1, verse 28, 
Where can we go? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are larger and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of Anakim there. So there he was, Joshua, meditating, patrolling maybe, his eyes looking out into the darkness. And then he, he notices some movement. Have you ever been out camping or out in the woods and, and you notice something? Last week, I was coming home at night and I close the door of, of the car and I'm, I'm walking up uh, in our neighborhood towards the entry, uh, sidewalk entry of our house. And, and I just noticed a little of something go by. And I was like, what, what was that? What was that? It, it wasn't a dog. And it was too big to be a cat. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going around and I'm looking and there in the entryway of this house is this bobcat. And he's just looking at me. And he's like sitting like, you know, a guard or, you know, anything like that. So he's just sitting there. It was totally awesome. I took a picture. You can look at it later. And, and we kind of stared each other down. He won. And so I go inside, and, and I, Jenny's there, and I go, Jen, there's a bobcat outside. And Jenny, being, you know, who she is, she immediately runs outside and chases the bobcat around the neighborhood. <laughs> Seriously, she did. It went up into the tree. She went over, and it came down the tree, and she went around, and the bobcat's like, I'm not messing with her. <laughs> it didn't move for me. But have you ever been there when you've seen something kind of out there? You wonder what that is. So I want you to picture that. And Joshua sees movement. And you can just imagine he's trying to fix his eyes on what he saw. His, his heart is racing. The adrenaline is pumping. And he stood there probably in his full warrior battle dress. And he probably got the sword out and it's gleaming in the moonlight. And a less courageous man, because we know he had been told a few times to what be strong and courageous. So a less courageous man would probably bolted, but not Joshua. In Joshua 5.13, now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or our adversaries? There was no way that Joshua could anticipate the next awesome moment that happened. Are, are you for us? Or are you with our enemies? Was met by an answer that probably, and we know, put him flat on his face. Neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. John Calvin said that the commander of the army of the Lord was a theophany, a temporary appearance of God in human flesh, pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, his incarnation, which would come centuries later that we talk about. But there are those times when Jesus shows up in the Old Testament in living color. And this is one of them. And we need to remember that Jesus had what going on? He had that sword drawn. And it signified something very special. It signified that the Lord himself would be fighting for Joshua. Would be fighting for the people of Israel. It was not Israel that would strike Jericho. But it was the Lord. Joshua realized, man, I, I got to take my sandals off. This commander, quote unquote, was the same God who spoke to Moses. Moses. 
Joshua 6, verses 2 through 5, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that way when you make a long blast with the ram's horn, and then you hear the sound of the trumpet. All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead." Man, I wish I had been there. Right? And this encounter served a purpose. It, it goes right along with that statement, be strong and courageous. It was to give Joshua the encouragement needed to lead God's way. See, he not only saw that God was with him, but that God's supernatural appearance with a sword pulled from from his side. The Lord was ready for battle. That had to be printed on Joshua's brain. All right, if he's ready for battle, I'm ready. God would fight for him. He knew that whatever the enemy had in store, whatever the enemy may be mobilized in their way, it would be matched and it would be exceeded by God. Oh, I love Romans chapter 8. Probably my favorite chapter of Scripture in the New Testament. And Romans 8.31 is one of those moments like this. If God is for us, Who could be against us? What was the effect of all of this on the life of Joshua? In a word, it produced those words in verse 30. By faith. The bedrock of faith that our writer of Hebrews has been talking about the whole time. Now faith, remember, is to be sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Joshua could look at those walls of Jericho now and go, yeah, they're going to fall. They're going to fall. And I'm called to be the general. You can just sense like this moment where Joshua kind of perks up He's got the battle gear on, and he's like, I am now General Joshua, the son of Nun. And then the orchestra plays, and (laughs) we start rolling with the scene. This enabled Joshua to to lead Israel to victory. And, And we've got to emphasize once again, as with Moses' believing parents, and Moses himself from last week, one, one person's faith can make all the difference. One, one person's faith can make all the difference for God's people. Joshua's faith was communicated to and then elevated throughout the whole nation's faith. And so can that be with yours and mine. No matter where we are planted, whether it is behind a machine or a desk or or in a house, if we live a dynamic certainty of faith regarding God's word, we will elevate and energize others to live as they ought. One person's faith can raise the level of an entire church. And that morning, as the bright rays of of sunshine start to come over the horizon, you could sense Joshua just being there going, all right, here's the plan. Here's the plan. 
and what happened in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days was the sign of many things, but to include a few, the walls of Jericho fell because of the faith of Joshua and also the faith of God's people. This, I would argue, was the greatest corporate act of faith in Israel's history. I don't think it ever was exceeded. And it has incredible lessons for us this morning. You see, we got to understand what this takes. It takes the obedience of faith. And we've talked about this so much, but the Lord himself had given explicit instructions to Joshua. And that then demanded obedience from the people. The detailed order and conduct of the famous procession around Jericho was actually very detailed. There was a precise order. Soldiers, then seven priests carrying seven ram's horns. Then significantly, and we need to remember this, I think sometimes we just kind of blow through these things. Okay, there's this, this group of people. In the center was what? The ark. In the center was the ark. In the middle was the presence of God. And then the people, and then the rear guard of soldiers. And even the conduct was required to be very different. During the first six days, they were to march around once, Maintaining absolute silence while the priests blared every once in a while on the ram's horns. And on the seventh day, they were to maintain silence as they circled the wall seven times until Joshua gave the command to shout. And that obedience, which we are called to as well, really leads to something that the world... <laughs> looks at us and goes, that's absolutely absurd. You guys are crazy. You are crazy people. By any outside estimation, those instructions are stupid. They're ridiculous. The uniform witness of military history is that the foe is always conquered by force. City walls are cleared by bombardment. They're scaled by ladders and ropes. Gates are smashed by battering horns. Troops take to the sword. Cities do not fall by people making bad music on ram's horns. And when the Canaanites got a good look at the procession, they undoubtedly exploded in laughter. Hoots, cat's calls, mocking. They, they, they couldn't believe their eyes. What are these fools doing? You know what? It's the same today. It is cool to make fun of Christians. It is. And that's fine. Just realize that for every one story you read on social media or podcast that mocks the Christian faith, I can tell you 10 stories of average everyday believers who because of their faith, sacrificing their time, their talent, and their treasure, God does amazing things through them. But the world makes fun because it's absurd. And our writer in Hebrews here understands that obviously as we've journeyed through this, as some of the people are looking back, going, yeah, this does seem a little absurd. 
And thus, verse 1 of chapter 11 is a reminder again. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. And Paul shares an all truth to the people that were reading his letter in Corinth. You know, if there was no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. We even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all men most to be pitied. Paul's like, yeah, you know what? If our faith is not true, if it's not hitched to what God has really done, then yes, it is absurd. But we're called to believe. Because even though these instructions looked foolish looked contrary to any human logic, Israel as a corporate body believed. Why did they have this uncharacteristic faith? Now, obviously, part of it was because of the recent experience in watching the Jordan River dry up when the ark went into the boundary of the river. The freshness of that recent miracle made them receptive to faith. But the other reason, I would argue, and I would touch on again, was the faith and character of the leader, Joshua. The iron certitude of General Joshua energized the troops. Thus, Israel really did believe God. They really did believe that God was going to give them Jericho. When the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell, he means that the Israelites actually had what? Real faith. They were not pretending to believe. They're like, all right, here we go. We'll see if this works. It was not bogus. And as they marched silently around the wall, they did believe the walls would come tumbling down. Their faith pleased God because they were believing that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. As we see in verse 6. The evidence that they believed God's word is that they what? Obeyed. They obeyed it. The sun had lifted. Joshua has assembled his elders, gives them the instructions from the divine commander. And they're moving quickly through the camp, sharing what's going on, calling the people together. Soon this long procession begins to wind around from the camp. It is vast in number, remember. It did not include all the people, but it included representative delegation from each tribe. The order, uh, ordered procession made its way towards the walled si- city in silence. Only broken by... A blast of a few ram's horns. This trip would take about two hours. And Jericho probably could be encircled in about 25 to 30 minutes. Now, you can imagine Josh was saying, hey guys, we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to stay a little back because we're going to stay out from the range of the archers. But they could still hear the taunts. But Israel never broke its silence. And this strange parade continued its absurd procession for six consecutive days. And you could just picture the shouting 
from the crowd going on, but this eerie silence of these circling fools, quote-unquote, probably start to begin to wear on them. What are these guys doing? The lesson here is that a life of faith is evidenced by a life of obedience to God's word. Even when it seems absurd. Paul's comments in his second letter to the Corinthians are appropriate here. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Hmm. See, to the unbelieving mind, the Christian weapons appear not only ineffective, but ridiculous. Oh, you you believe in the Bible. Well, that's stupid. You're one of those people. Whoever stormed a walled city wearing wearing truth for a belt. Faith for a shield. Salvation for a helmet. The Bible for a sword. That's the armament of clowns. But you see, God gives direction in his word on how we meet our Jerichos in our lives. Instructions that are complete folly to any sort of secular human logic. For example, you're filling out your income tax form and realize that if you list uh, a little extra hidden income, you will be put in a higher tax bracket and you're going to have to pay more taxes. And you're kind of up against the wall and you go, should I be honest? You have a choice. Do what the world says is logical. Hide it. Or are you truthful, trusting God is going to take care of you? How about a few, we have a few college students in the room here. None of you ever do poorly in class, I'm sure. But you need that B to get into grad school. And you're working on that final exam and you realize it's not going to happen. You're like, oh, this stinks. But you notice that a neighboring student who is, uh, let's say, an A student is in eyeshot, not earshot, eyeshot during class. And you can read all of that person's answers. Uh, Some people would maybe rationalize it and say, God provides. Or do you trust God to work things out as he sees fit because you need to be truthful to his word? What if you disagree with a vaccine mandate and you hear of fake vaccine cards being available? Or maybe you trust in God and you stand up and tell people what you really believe. Maybe you've been wronged by an enemy. Now you have a chance to get them back. They will never know that you did it. Everyone would applaud you in your friend group. And you know you complete certainty that you could get away with it. But you remember the words of Jesus. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you go, but I will tell you right now, everyone, I would rather live the fool's parade of faith 
than live the world's way of destruction. See, Scripture is very clear about many things, but one of them that we all know as believers, disobedience reveals unbelief. Disobedience to God's Word reveals unbelief, but obedience to God evidences our faith. When difficult circumstances attack us, unbelief draws from the arsenals of the world. Faith, faith in Christ causes us to take up the armor of God and takes us to the absurd march around Jericho. Every single one of us in this room have Jerichos that we are dealing with, right? Wavering between God's way and the world's way of meeting it. Do you believe in God's word? Do you have the authenticity of your belief grounded in the fact that it determines the weapon you choose? Belief or unbelief? And that zeroes in then the focus of faith that we see here. I told you, what was the centerpiece of the procession? The ark. The centerpiece of the procession is the ark, God's presence. The account mentions the ark no less than 11 times when you read through Joshua's account. The ark was there in the middle with the priest horns Blasting constantly, it's, it's heralding God's presence. It was God's presence that circled Jericho those seven days. It was His presence that would bring the fall. Central to, to Israel's great exercise of faith here was the awareness of what? That God was with them leading them. And we need to emphasize this. They were not imagining this. God was truly present and he manifested himself specifically in that outward expression of the ark and the realization that he was physically in their midst had a massive impact on the Israelites' exercise of faith. John Bunyan In his church in England, there was a poem framed in the wall of the side room from which the preacher exited to walk to the pulpit. And it said these words, Enter this door as if the floor within were gold, and every wall of jewels, all of wealth untold. As if a choir in robes of fire were singing here. Nor shout, nor rush, but hush, for God is near. You imagine walking in, reading that, going, God is here. I am to preach with the authority of God in his word. That's what we need. That is what enables us to conquer the evil opposition that is in front of all of us. We need to understand that God is with us. I would, you know, it would blow us away. I add this in here a little bit. Wouldn't it be interesting if on a given Sunday morning we suddenly had the ability to see the unseen? To see the angels among us, maybe sitting next to us. Perhaps if the preaching were better, we might see the angels with their Bibles listening intently. (laughs) 
1 Peter 1.12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. We don't talk about spiritual warfare enough, do we? We, we need to, because it's, it's thick, it's out there, it's in our world, everywhere. And as the Israelites encircled Jericho, the Canaanites saw nothing more than this ragtag group of people with some golden box. But the Israelites saw the unseen. Their focus was on God, and they knew God's special presence was with them. This is faith's focus, everyone. This is the focus that brings down the enemy walls. This is the declaration of faith. It had to be very difficult for the Israelites to keep silent during those first six days. Could you imagine it? Mm. Because they had faith. So this wasn't like walking around going, this isn't going to happen, isn't it? No, they had faith. So this anticipation of like, this is going to be the coolest thing ever is building up more and more every circle around the city. And they had to keep silent. Enemies aren't practicing restraint. We can be sure of that. We can even imagine, though, that, you know, They're circling around and not one stone in the walls have been loosened yet. There's no cracks starting to form in the city wall. You could kind of picture maybe in a movie where they're like walking around or, you know, marching around and there's little fissures starting to go up or anything. None of that was happening because that is not what is described. These people were not going, oh, we're going to retreat. They didn't see any reason to be afraid of these guys. It had to be then a great relief on the seventh day when Joshua ordered them to rise early, circle Jericho seven times, finish with a great shout at his cue. And in Joshua 6, we describe this event. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab, who we're talking about next week, The harlot and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Joshua 6.20, we'll jump down there. So the people shouted and priests blew the trumpets. Hey, if you looked at the email I sent this week, yesterday, it said to bring trumpets. Did anyone bring a trumpet? I didn't think so, but that's okay. I brought mine. So here it is. Here's the trumpet. Siva, put that away. (laughs) All right. Notice it's missing something, right? Mouthpiece. I got that. I got that. I haven't played this thing in 30 years, so it's going to be awful. All right. So you have this scenario. And the truth is, is we actually have a, Uh, a ram's horn in back from uh, our Messianic Jewish congregation, and I forgot to ask them for permission to use it. And I'd rather not break that out and have the world know that I did that without asking. (laughs) That whole conviction thing. So this trumpet, I started playing this thing in fourth grade. Same trumpet all the way through through high school, marching band stuff. Got to play a halftime show uh, 
with Arizona State and USC playing one my senior year, we won the state marching festival, and I got to go out into the middle of this field with the Arizona State Marching Band and our band because we had won the competition. And I got to go out there with these seven other trumpeters from the ASU band and play a solo with them with like 400 people on the field and 70,000 people in the stands. It was pretty awesome. My solo was not awesome. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I played one note correctly. But it didn't matter because the other seven guys did. But what was so cool about it was the power of the group of people that believed that this music was going to be heard. 70,000 people in the stands, most of which were not paying attention to what was going on on the field. But there was something that night that was just different. And we started playing, and the song was awesome. But at the end of that song came the thing that if you ever go to a college football game, and it's packed, and it's a rivalry game, and it's stuff that's going on, you know the song that everyone responds to at that home stadium is the fight song. USC's probably got the coolest fight song on the planet. It gets in your head and messes with you. <laughs> Arizona State, no one knows, but actually I think it's the best one. But you get out there and you blow that horn and people listen. So the people shouted and the priests blew their trumpets. So this is what I'm going to do right now. I, I need your help. I am not going to play this. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going, to blow, I'm going to blow this badly, but you have to participate. I know this will, I mean, some of you, this will scare you to death to do this. I'm going to blow this and then you need to shout. All right, all right, Davis has no problem. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? So I'm going to blow this thing. I don't know what's going to come out of it. Spit, uh, all different stuff. Mold. But I'm going to blow this thing, and then you're going to shout. You don't have to stand. If you want to, that's awesome. Some of you may go, this is like way too charismatic. I, whatever. No, this is biblical. It's in the Bible, so we're going to do it. But, but the reason I'm doing this is I wanted, I wanted a, just a moment to remember something fun, obviously, together. But two, the power of doing something absurd. Because this is absurd. But this was what was happening. So, you know, you got the old westerns, and you got the guy with the bugle. Right? Right? You got the... Uh, shh, shh. And, and then John Wayne goes through, and, and they win, and all of that. But none of that happened. At least not then. They blow the horns... The people shouted, and then the walls fall down. Then they move in. I think a little louder. <laughs> That's going to live in everyone's memory. All right. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the walls fell down, so that the people went up into the city, and every man straight ahead, and they took the city. When the trumpets shouted, the people shouted. When the sound of the trumpet happened, the loud shout 
happened. The walls collapsed. Then people charged in. They took the city. It was the voice of faith. It was the outward expression of the faith that was within. What is the outward expression of the faith that is within for us as believers? It's behind these walls back here. It's behind these shutters. Baptism. The outward expression of faith. The ring of faith saying, I believe. Yeah, say it with me. I believe. believe. That Christ gave for us, that picture where we say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And because of that, I am now buried in faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Risen in death, raised up to walk a new life in Him. An outward expression of faith. What is the other outward expression of faith? The ordinance of faith that we have that we do every Sunday. Communion. We're believers. So yeah, communion's just for believers. Because it's totally absurd, isn't it? To believe that one man gave his body and his blood as a sacrifice for all. But communion is a declaration of faith as well. That is why we always need to remember that true faith obeys God's God and His Word. Even when it seems absurd, even so, even, even we've got to reject the world's argument. We have to reject the world's arguments and we have to don the ridiculous armor of God. And we need to march confidently in a fool's army that marches to victory. See, true faith obeys. True faith focuses upon God. It cultivates a special sense of his presence that he is with his people and refuses. It's a faith that refuses to divert its focus away from God. And yes, it, true faith always declares itself in a fallen world. We do not run and hide. That city on a hill with that lamp, do you put it under a bushel? What does the song say? Yeah. No, I am going to let it shine. True faith declares itself to a fallen world. So we're just going to wrap this up with a, a question You don't have to say it out loud what the answer is for you. But how is your faith in Christ? All of this is happening and is an example for us to remember who still fights the battle of faith. Who fights for us? God. Christ. The Spirit. And by learning from these believers, learning from Joshua, our writer of Hebrews is letting us know this little beleaguered church that was getting beat up in the first century there, and the persecution was getting ramped up. He's letting them know that you will have victory in the Lord. And he will cause the impossible walls to tumble down. You will never do it in your own strength. So have faith. Have faith alone in him.